Welcome to your Ultima Life Podcast, where we help you break free from mediocrity and create a life of purpose, prosperity, and joy. Get your free video series at yourultimatelife.ca. Hello and welcome to this episode of Your Ultimate Life. In fact, welcome to Your Ultimate Life, the podcast dedicated completely to helping you create the life of purpose, prosperity, and joy that everybody wants and that so few seem to get. Grateful today to have a guest with me, a high-powered financial guy who I've had a chance to meet and hear his stuff. And so I'm excited to have him. Chris, welcome to the show. Uh, Thanks for having me on. It's an honor. You are absolutely welcome. And so one of the things I like to ask right out of the box uh, is uh, nothing standard. So Chris, I'd like you to wax a little poetic and tell us, the listeners, how does Chris add good to the world? Oh, gosh, that's a great question. So, you know, I've gone through lots of ups and downs in my life. And the best way I feel I can add good is by just sheerly showing love to everybody and teaching people how to solve their financial problems primarily. And I just find that the more I give, the more I help people solve problems, the more I get out of life. I I love that. And that's an, you know, in, in the large scheme of things, that's an unusual position. The more I give, the more I get out of life. So tell me a little bit about the the journey that got you to this place where you would make such a statement. The more I give, the more I get out of life because, you know, you don't fall up that mountain. So tell me a little bit more about that uh, climb. Sure. Now, before I tell you about the climb, let me just kind of go right back to the give. So there was a long, t- not that, that was about a decade ago, I was at a mastermind that I shouldn't have been at because I couldn't afford to be there. I was in a really tough financial place. And I remember the man that put the event on, I, I finally got some free time with him. And I, I said to him, I said, Greg, I said, I need the best advice you can give me. And he knew my circumstance. He knew I, I was hurting. And he puts his hand on my shoulder and he leans into me and he says, Chris, I'm going to give you the best advice I can give anyone. And I'm like, yes, Come on, give it to me, Greg. And then he says, give your best stuff away for free. And that was it. And I kind of stood there dumbfounded being like, really, Greg, that that's the best advice you got for me. I just paid five grand plus hotel plus flights to be at this mastermind. And that's the advice. It has single handedly been the best advice I could have ever gotten. So let me take you back. So I didn't grow up in a family with money. I grew up in a lower middle-class family. Dad was an alcoholic. And my mom raised me and taught me to be a dreamer. And she never stood in the way of any stupid idea I ever had, like digging a pond in the backyard because, hey, I I wanted to go fishing. Instead of trying to find a way to get to a pond, I just said, let's dig a pond. I I physically dug a pond that entire summer. Uh, Right up to when I told my mom I wanted to be a pro snowboarder. And I live in Buffalo, New York, so it's not exactly the mecca for snowboarding. She didn't say, Chris, that's a stupid idea. We don't even have mountains. She always taught me to dream. Well, getting into the story, I remember when I started working at 14 on a farm, I I loved it. I loved having a little extra money to do things. Then I got a real job at 16, but that job was at a restaurant where the the business owner who I worked for treated me so poorly, degraded me so badly that I physically was, was, was in a depressed state. I mean, I would come home and I would... I would feel like I couldn't do anything right. My grades fell at school and my mom saw all this happening, but she didn't know why because I wouldn't you know, share the, the bad stuff that went on at work. But there was one day I hit a breaking point and that was the day that I actually came into work. He started in on me and I just said, I quit. And when I quit that job, remember, this is my first real job outside of the farm. So I couldn't just come home to mom and say, mom, I quit my first job. So I had to come up with this plan. And the idea I came up with was I was going to create a clothing line in my mom's basement. And I called it Fat Clothing Company, P-H-A-T, which meant cool back then. This is in the early 90s. And when I told her that, she didn't again say, that's a stupid idea. I can't believe you quit your job. She said, that's great. What what is it going to look like? What are you going to do? And I came up with some graphics. But anyway, I started printing shirts at high school with my art teacher, Mr. Mahalski. And I printed my first dozen shirts, sold those to my friends made two dozen, sold those, three dozen, got a couple of my friends to sell them and and so on and so forth. And I had a regular business going, which means now I also had a purpose out of school. So now instead of just going to school to get through the motions and get good grades to appease mom and the principals and the teachers, I was going to school to learn how to run a business. 
my accounting class all of a sudden became my favorite class. My typing class became really important because I needed to type up brochures and things. My business <laughs> law class, I'm co- what kid likes business law? Became right. unbelievably fascinating. You see, I had a way to take knowledge which prior was useless, and now I could apply that knowledge in real life applications. And I just loved school from that point on. Now I continued to do that straight through college and that clothing line became a skateboard snowboard shop, which almost was one of those dreams that I got that almost completely crashed and burned because everybody told me no. Everybody said, no, it's a stupid idea. You'll lose all your money. Remember my mom, who I keep talking about in this story, she was my unconditional one. And she didn't have any money. She had no assets. I needed 70 grand to open this store. And my mom, when all of it was crumbling down and my dad told me to get a job at the factory and the, every bank I went to except for one told me no. And the one that said yes said, we'll give you an SBA back loan, but you need collateral. I'm 17 years old. Do you think I know what collateral is? <laughs> I'm Probably like, what not. Is that? Yeah. yeah. They're, they're like, it's something of value. I'm like, great. I got a KX 125 dirt bike. I got a 1986 Buick Skyhawk. And I got this really great baseball and football card collection. What do you say? And they're like, kid, we're kind of thinking about something like real estate. Well, my mom had the house that she got in the divorce. And that house was a two bedroom, one bath, about 750 square foot house. And that's where we lived. And she put that house on the line so that her punk snowboard kid, this guy right here, could chase his dream. And that's, that's when things got real. I was a real entrepreneur then with real risks. And that risk was if I didn't make it, we lost our house. So imagine being 17. Imagine having that pressure on your shoulders. You start to shape up or you ship out really quick. And that's what I did. And all through my life, that's what I've done. I've just chased that dream. I've never let anybody stop me, but I've failed a lot of times. I almost went bankrupt many times with different businesses, but I've never ever completely forgotten or for, you know abandoned my dream. So, you know, when you talk about the ultimate life, I think the ultimate life comes down to a lot of things that really are just up in our mind. It's that idea that we plant that dream that's ours and only ours that we got to chase in life. So the ultimate life is just going after it and never stopping, but making sure that along your journey, you're always helping people. So back then there was a skateboard snowboard shop. I mean, I was helping people with skateboard snowboards, but very different than when I started in the money space where I was actually truly able to change people's lives. But you see, the money space for me didn't start where I'm at today. It started in Wall Street. And it started in Wall Street not because I wanted to be a Wall Street kid. I didn't want to put a suit on. It started because in early 2000s, when the planes hit the tower and we entered the dot-com recession, first recession I ever had as an entrepreneur, I realized that I couldn't pay my bills. So I needed to get a job. Put a resume out and Wall Street calls me back. And that was the only people that called me back. So hence, all right. Let's go work in Wall Street. So that's how I entered the traditional financial world. But Wall Street's a really, and I don't want to say this the wrong way, but it's a very greedy place. It's a place of self-centered, egotistical human beings. And I don't think there's any wrong way to say that. There isn't. That's, and that's just why I'm how it is. Great. That's exactly <laughs> yeah. how it is. But so I, and it's funny thing is, is I, I was really good at Wall Street. I really was. But I also became one of them. And I, I say that. Kind of, you know, some, sometimes we have to understand there's there's two sides to us, right? And and there's the side that, you know, what I grew up with, those dreams and everything else. And then all of a sudden there came this side where it was about making more money, more money, more money. But I was making money the wrong ways because that's what I was taught to do in Wall Street. And that's what I watched everybody else doing. So I'd literally go there and I would do all this stuff. And then I'd come home and I'd run my shops and I'd be back in that world that I loved. And it was a drastic difference. It was like a tug of war internally where in my shops, I felt like I felt like the person I was supposed to be, that pro snowboarder, running skateboard snowboard shops. And then when I went to Wall Street and put that suit and tie on, I almost felt like I morphed into this person I wasn't, but I had to be because I was so addicted to making the money and it was the more money than I'd ever made. And I wanted to be the guy that was on the leaderboards. And boy, I did I. I spent 16 years, 16 years in Wall Street doing that. And I feel like what I do today is really me just kind of making good for all the things that I didn't do, that, all the things I didn't did wrong, all the, I don't want to say people that I hurt, but the people I didn't help the way I should have in Wall Street. So, you know, when I talk about giving and I talk about that, that one statement from Greg, where he said, I'm going to give you the best advice. And that is give your best stuff away for free. 
You see, I went into that conversation. I went into that receiving of that information with all the wrong ideas. You see, I had all these ideas in my mind, but I want to sell everything. I wanted to make tons of money by selling this and selling that and selling this. And here this guy says, give all that away for free. And if you do that, people will, will respect that and people will have problems solved by you giving your best away for free. And then what you'll get will be so much more. See, he understood that. I didn't. And that uh, leads me up till now. And I mean, I've, I've, it's weird. And a lot of people listening to this are just not going to fully understand this. Money, yes, I know that's what we all want. I'm a money guy because that's what I teach today. But money means nothing in the grand scheme of why we're here. Money's just a tool that allows us to do good. And when we start doing bad with money, we actually have to pay the price for doing bad. And, and I paid the price. I went bankrupt many times. I just, you know, during those bad years, those 16 years, I call them, there's so many bad things that happened to me. So many things that just never went right. I, I literally was going through life a lot of times just saying, how come nothing ever can just go right? How come nothing's ever easy? But you see now today, it's almost just like things just happen for me, not to me. And it's, it's because all I do is give and give and give. And the more I give, the more that just is put in front of me. And so I'm going to stop you there. I want to dig back into a couple of things because you made some really <clears throat> important points. And I define the ultimate life as a life of purpose, prosperity, and joy. And I put purpose first for the reasons that you've described. Why did Wall Street call you when you were looking for a job? What was it about your skill set that made someone at Wall Street call you to give you a job? Interesting. This was during the dot-com crash, mm -hmm. and I had nothing on my resume that would make me appeal to a Wall Street person except for I was a self-starter and an entrepreneur. And that was literally what my resume said. It had been on one piece of paper. I was an entrepreneur, a pro snowboarder, and that's all I knew. So I guess in Wall Street, and I, I'd been told this many times, what they look for is somebody that can, can be given you know, an instruction or be given you know, a task. And they just go at it without having somebody hold their hand. They didn't require somebody constantly telling them what to do. And an entrepreneur by its sheer nature is somebody that just goes after things because that's just how you have to do it. So I think that's what they saw in me. And that's, so that's the only thing they could have. That's fabulous because I wanted, <clears throat> we, you didn't say that, which is fine. And I wanted to get there because I didn't know the answer. But now that you've said that to me, that is so important because people listening to this who think I can't have the ultimate life. <clears throat> I don't know what my life purpose is. Prosperity is a dream, not something that's within my reach. And joy, gee, that's something I'll have someday when this, that, and the other. And none of those things are true. And you've just are illustrated that by that fact. You decided, because that's who you are, I'm a self-starter. I do stuff. You went and became a pro snowboarder. In other words, you took the effort and time in Buffalo, New York, to go do the work that it took to go places. I learned to snowboard when I was um, 50. I didn't learn to ski till I was 45. And because I'm sort of an A type, I took lessons and I told, you know, I'm 50 years old, right? So you can get this. I went to the mountain and it was in Banff, Alberta, which is uh, sunshine, which is a gorgeous place. You've probably been there. But anyway, I hired some guy and I said, all right, I'm gonna learn to snowboard. I don't know anything about it. And skiing, I'd learned five years before. And of course, skiing side to side and snowboarding is front to back in terms of your balance. And so I said, and they said, now the first thing we got to know is we're going to, you know, client safety. And he got it on with the speech, right? And I said, all right, screw you and all your stuff. I want you to beat the crap out of me until I know how to do this. Okay. Would that be okay? I mean, I bought your whole day. Uh, okay. And so then about lunchtime, he said, well, let's go have lunch. I said, screw your lunch. Keep working. I'll tell you when I'm tired. About three in the afternoon, I fell over backwards on the hill and I said, OK, I'm done. <laughs> OK, and I did that. So the self-starter I get and I finally learned to snowboard and I didn't ever quite get as good boarding as I did skiing. But I, I get it. And I didn't learn till I was 50 and I own the scars to prove it. So I understand, at least to a degree, the effort you went through to get to that level of self-starting, which is the key not only to getting called by wall street but to getting anything done that you want nobody's going to do your push-ups nobody's coming for you the cavalry isn't coming at all over the hill or otherwise and you can get all the help you need but it's up to you to be the engine so i just wanted to ask that question and dig into that for a second because i thought it was fabulous 
So I interrupted a flow in your story because oh, I wanted no. to, to dwell on that for a minute. So go ahead if you can remember right where you were. Ah, uh, there was no flow. I was just kind of reliving the memories, you know, reliving the good, the bad, and the ad- indifferent. But uh, you know, I had mentioned I spent 16 years in Wall Street, and you know, a lot of people are like, well, why, why'd you stop? Well, my dreams changed. Uh, after 2008, I almost went bankrupt, but I got into real estate shortly thereafter because that's what all my wealthy clients were doing. My wealthy clients were not investing money with me, and I knew they had money, but I would always say, "What do you, you know, what do you do? Like, how how are you investing all? Because I knew how much they had, how much, all this money." And they said, "Well, we invest in real estate," and I didn't understand it, but I learned it very quickly. And when the whole bottom fell out, guess what happened? economy provided the best Walmart style rollback ever in real estate. And you see, I understood Warren Buffett's statement, buy low, sell high, and don't lose money. And guess what was on sale? Everything but real estate was really on sale. So 2009, I mustered up everything I could and I started buying apartment buildings. The next few years, that's all I did. And I took a lot of the time that I used to spend in the financial world. Now at that point, remember, I had a really good base of clients. So I was doing very well financially. During 2008, I wasn't, you know, I almost went bankrupt. But after I started to get back on my feet, I was just taking all the money I made there and I was buying real estate, pennies on the dollar. And I was borrowing from a, a local community bank. And I got up to 2014, 36 doors. So I had 36 doors in my rental portfolio. I mean, that was pretty good for a young kid, self-starter. And then I went for my 37th deal and the bank shut me down. The same bank, the same guy, Greg, who always gave me all the loans, shut me down. And they said, you don't fit in a little square box. I'm like, how? My income has gone up. My rental income has gone up. Like, what's changed? She said, yeah, but you've been taking on debt. And you've been doing this in your personal name. So now your debt to income ratio is out of whack. We can't lend to you anymore. And also, while we're at it, because he was a pretty straight shooter, most people from New York are, he said, we have to freeze your line of credit. And that line of credit was my lifeblood. Like that was my lifeline in real estate. I used it to renovate units. So it was game over. So now as fast as I had built up this rental portfolio, it was starting to unwind very quickly. I couldn't finish units. I was running out of money when tenants would not pay, which happened all the time. And I'd have to evict them. I'd have one, two months of period of time with no rent. So I started getting behind and the bank put more pressure on me. Now, long story short, All that stuff with the bank was happening because that bank was being bought out by a big conglomerate. Now, I didn't know that then, but that's what was going on. But it crumbled my whole dream of this real estate thing. So from there, I didn't give up. I just changed gears. I said, let's start flipping houses. And I had my wife now, Larissa, who who back then was my girlfriend. She was like, yeah, let's, let's flip houses. It seemed cool, right? There were some shows on TV, which we got infatuated with. And we started thinking to ourselves, hey, we're doing a pretty good job flipping these houses. Why don't we film a sizzle reel? So again, that worthy idea was planted in my mind, folks. Now, my focus had changed from just doing real estate for money to now I wanted a TV show. And that's all we did. We focused on it. And lo and behold, it's kind of funny how the universe works, folks. In your journey, when you think about something and you can't stop thinking about it and you dream about it, the only thing that can happen if you never stop thinking about it is you will have it. And we did in 2018, that show was ready to air on HGTV. It was called Risky Builders. You can look it up. But now I hit a roadblock. You see, I was a financial advisor. I had sold my retail stores, that skateboard snowboard chain in 2010. I had sold the strip mall that I had developed, which almost bankrupt me for, for that retail store. So now I'm just doing financial advisory and real estate. But now I have this TV show. So as a, a financial advisor, I was actually a, what they call an IAR, which is a investment advisory representative for a registered investment advisor. Too much to talk about, but I had to get approval for every outside business activity I did. So I went to this girl who I always went to. She was great in compliance. I said, hey, you know that TV show I've been talking about? We got it. Yeah, I need an OBA. I need to just get this approved. And she said, I can't give you an OBA for that. That's a public television show. There's no way we're going to get an approval. So you're going to have to make a decision, Chris. Are you going to be a financial advisor or a TV show star? I'm like, okay, easy decision. I'm selling my practice. I went to Mike, sold my financial advisory practice. And I thought that was my next big thing was this TV show. It aired six times. Second out of green light, which means really good, great ratings. 
And then HG sells to Discovery, puts the brakes on all new shows and says, you're not going on to series. So folks, the roller coaster rides in my life have been severe. Imagine you just burned the boats. You have no income outside of your real estate. And this TV show is everything you've ever wanted up to this point. And now the door slams in your face and you've got no plan. But when one door closes, another door opens. And the door opened, I'm gonna keep using his name, Greg. You're gonna think everybody in my life was Greg. My mortgage broker was Greg. Greg, the guy that was that was running the mentorship. The mastermind, right. Coach was Greg. And my business partner at this point was also Greg. Three different Gregs. I'm sorry we're doing the Greg show today. But That's okay. Greg, <laughs> Greg called me. So I had drove home. And listen, you know, I had had stupid thoughts. You know, I, I, I this is a big one. And I literally almost thought about not going home that night. I almost thought about just jerking the wheel of that truck at high speeds into the tree just so I didn't have to bring that news to my my wife that we weren't going to get the show and we've just burned the boats on everything else. But I did. And as soon as I told her, she handled it pretty well. My phone rings. So I pick my phone up and it's this this Greg guy, right? And I'm like, oh. somebody tipped him off, he knows. And I'm like, hey, Greg. And he's like, hey, you know, I'm just so excited about the things we're doing, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, all right, who told you? Because, you know, who calls you when you're down in your luck trying to cheer you up? You know, it's somebody that knows bad things happen. And he said, I don't know anything. He's like, what happened? I said, Greg, we didn't get the show. Thinking, it, you know, sometimes in your mind you're negative, so you think negatively. I'm thinking Greg isn't going to want to be my friend. He's not going to be want to be my partner because I don't got this TV show anymore. And he's not going to want anything to do with this loser who just had a show and now doesn't. But he said, no, actually, Chris, he said, that's the best news ever. And I'm like, excuse me? I just, I just got the news that our TV show, Greg, you know, the, the HGD, JTV thing, that's not going forward. And he said, I know. He said, I was, I was not going to say anything because I knew you were so excited about it, but it's the best thing ever because I think that show would have taken you down a path that it takes a lot of them down and you would have never been able to do anything other than appease the network. But now you're free to do all the things that we've been talking about doing in I'm here to support you. And I think this is the greatest thing ever. One door closed, that door opened. But I didn't know what that door was, but I gladly walked through it. I'm going to stop you right here because yes. I want to. So right there, one door closes, another door open, and Greg's on the phone. So we'll come right back there. But he, here, he, here's the thing. How many times have you described, even in this little segment, and it's not a complete number, have you crashed into a wall? Something failed, this failed, that failed, almost bankrupt here, actually bankrupt there, you know, completely rug jerked out from under you here, there, and everywhere, spending 16 years choking on ethics you don't like at Wall Street and turning you into somebody you didn't want. And here's the thing I want to leave for the listeners to glean out of this. In every one of them, the common denominator is Chris, even though he thought dark thoughts and everyone has been there. And thank you for saying that because people need to understand that when they feel hopeless and helpless, it's not the end. It's just a chapter. So if you don't like the story, turn some pages and turning pages means start again, follow the idea, get some help, create a new dream and move forward. And so that's been a recurring theme. And I just wanted to underline that with an exclamation point. And we're back to Greg on the phone. So, you know, now I had this new path, this brand new open pasture, white canvas, whatever you want to call it, where I now needed to create again. And, and folks, if I can just talk about that real quick, and, I, and you already know this, I, I heard you speak on this creation. You notice everything I've been talking about, everything I've mentioned is a form of creation. And, and I read this really interesting thing, actually listened to it from Earl Nightingale, and he talks about a study that was done by a doctor because he wanted to know what is the difference between someone who becomes successful and someone who fails. He's, and he said, there's got to be a common denominator between the two. And through this whole study, what they found, and they did it, a study on 125-year-olds, and they just asked him, are you going to be successful at the age of retirement? And they 100% said yes. But at age 65 or whatever you deem retirement, when they pulled the same group, that wasn't what happened. You see, the fact and the statistics are that only five out of those 100 eager, optimistic 25-year-olds will be financially successful. The other 95% will not be financially successful. So he, he came down to the conclusion that the difference 
between the five and the 95 was one thing. The 5% or the five of those 25 year olds created their destiny, created their financial path, created their dream, created something that led them to that path of success. So what happened to the other 95%? What happened to them is the same thing that has almost happened to me through my whole life. They conform to somebody's failed reality, somebody's failed dream, somebody's failed plan because somebody told them that this is what they should do based on what they've done in their life. You see, here's the thing that I can tell you that I've been very fortunate and, and blessed by God to have, have been able to dodge is conformity. Through my whole life, between my father, family members, friends, I've had so many people tell me, and it's always when you're at the lowest point, tell you, just do this, and this is what you should be doing, and that's silly. Why are you always chasing these dreams? Why are you trying to do this? Why are you trying to do this? Just be, can't you just be normal? I've almost taken the bait so many times, but I don't know why something in me, that fire just never went out and always said, no, create, create, create. Folks, the difference between success and failure is simple, it's creation. And the only way to fail is to allow yourself to fail. The only way not to succeed is to conform to somebody else's failed plan. So all I did is I went forward and I created and, and I had a little help. And this is the final story and I'll wrap with this to get me where I'm at today. And this is, this is still 10 years ago. After that door closed, I was still doing real estate because that's, that's what I knew at that point. I had retired from Wall Street, sold my practice. So I had a little bit of cash and I'm out in Salt Lake City snowboarding. And there's this guy who used to lend me money. His name was Mike. Thank God it's not Greg, right? Right. This guy, we Mike, need a fourth one. We'll get confused here. Keep going. He was, he was a very wealthy guy. He had a TV show. He was actually one of the reasons why we got introduced to the, the production company, but long, that's another story. And I'm sitting, I'm in Salt Lake and I call him up. I say, Hey, Mike, can we meet for lunch? I'm in your neck of the woods. I got this deal. I'd like to run by and see if you'd be interested in lending. He said, sure. Meet me at Cheesecake Factory downtown. So I meet him there and I'm showing him the deal. And I just asked him, I said, Mike, um, you know, how do you lend all this money? Like, how does this all work? And he says, it's simple, Chris. I lend you and everybody else money from my private banking system. And I'm like, ooh, private banking system, Mike. I didn't know you had a bank. Why, did you, why are we here at Cheesecake Factory? We should just go to your bank and get some of those dumb, dumb suckers that you guys give away. <laughs> and he said to me, no, no, Chris, I don't have a bank. He said, I just mimic what a bank does. I created a system. I was in the system and, and I just started, you know, questioning them. I said, so tell me about this banking system. Cause I came from wall street. So I'm like, I got to know about this and I'm going to, I'm going to figure this out. And he says, well, I put my money in a different place than most people do. I put it in a place where it pays me guaranteed interest. I'm like, okay, guaranteed interest. And he says, then I get paid dividends every single year. Okay. Guaranteed interest plus dividends. And he said, my money works in a tax efficient manner. It's tax-free growth inside the place where I put it. I said, so guaranteed interest, tax-free plus dividends. Like, what could this be? I'm thinking Roth. I'm thinking a bunch of stuff in my head. And then he goes and he says, so when you come to me and you want to borrow money, I go to my banking system and I take a loan and I give it to you. And when I give you the money, you pay me interest, right? Chris, how much do you pay me? I'm like, too much, 15%. He's like, right. But when I gave you that money and you paid me 15%, the money that I gave you, you see, it never left my account. And I'm like, oh, here we go. This is hocus pocus stuff. Now Mike's trying to bait me in on something. He's like, no, 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 no. He says, the place where I put my money, every penny of my money is still there earning uninterrupted compounding interest. When you have my money, and you're paying me interest. And I just take the interest you pay me and I put it back in the same place. You see, Chris, draw a circle. He said, my money starts on one side of the circle. I move it over to the other side, but the money never left the place where it started. So now the money is working twice for me. I'm making money twice on the same dollar. And then I take the money that this money earns me, which is the interest you pay me on it. And I take it and I move it around the bottom part of the circle back to the same place it started. I'm earning uninterrupted compounding interest, plus I'm making a spread on my money. And he said, Chris, how do banks make money? I said, well, I make deposits there and then they lend that money out at a higher interest rate. He's like, right, they make a spread. Well, I make a spread just like the bank does. And I do this over and over again, but you see there's a powerful thing called compounding interest that my money never stops earning, which is why I have so much money. And because, because of the system, I never ever lose money. Like my money's always going up because of just mathematics. And I'm just, I'm blown away. And I'm just like, what the heck? 
And then I, I say to him, Mike, I said, listen, I'm, I was an advisor for a long time, man. What? I've never heard of anything like this. And I know of everything. He's like, I'm like, what is it? And he drops the bomb on me. He said, well, Chris, you know exactly what it is. You probably did this when you were an advisor. He said, it's a specially designed whole life. You see, I didn't hear specially designed. I just heard whole life insurance. And he said, I use a concept called the infinite banking concepts, which is that circle that I told you I moved money around. I didn't hear any of that either because all I heard is that this guy just told me that the secret to his wealth was a vehicle that we were always told is a terrible place to put your money called whole life insurance. But you see, it wasn't the product that mattered. And this is what I missed then. It was the process he did, but I was so intrigued with this. I said, Mike, you got to show me how to do this. And he said, I can't. You got to call this guy, Brent, who taught me how to do it. Hence, I left Cheesecake Factory. I called Brent. Brent made me watch a 90 minute video. I didn't want to watch it, but he made me watch it before he talked to me. In that 90 minute video, all I can tell you is, you know, certain things in your life will happen and certain things will just click and you'll all of a sudden unlock something that has been there the entire time during your entire life. It's always been there, but all of a sudden you'll have an understanding of it. And when you have an understanding of it, you can never go back. And I had an understanding of what he showed me, which was just a concept, just a process. And Brent had been my, he was, he was my mentor. And, you know, he, he says to me now, now he's been my business partner today, but he said, sometimes the student becomes the teacher. So what do I do today? I teach that same concept to tens of thousands of people throughout the country. And I don't ask for a penny from any of them. And you know this, you saw me speak. I said, you know, I'm not here to sell anyone anything. I'm just here to teach you how to change your financial future. And that's all I do today. So remember when I said, Greg said, give your best stuff away for free. That's what I do. And because of that, the universe gives me more than I know what to do with. So I just keep giving it back and keep giving it back. And now we got a private foundation and we do a lot of giving. And it's funny because the more we give, the more we get. And, and I, many of you are listening to this thinking this is hocus pocus, but folks, I lived it. I see it every day. I don't know any other way to explain it. I literally don't. I'm just giving it to you straight. That's how it works. You know this. We talk. You talk about this. I, I do. And so here's what I want you to do right now. Our, our time is coming to a close, but I absolutely want everyone to be able to get this information. So whether it's the link to a website or the link to the fabled 90 minute video or wherever they can find this best stuff for free. And uh, you guys have followed me on the podcast. You know that I don't do stuff on here that isn't true and that I don't know myself. I just don't. And there's been no guest on here ever in our 900 nearly episodes that that where that's not true. So I've seen this. I understand the concept. And I think it's spectacular, and I think you should know about it, and you can decide what, what you do or don't do about it. So where do they find this free stuff? Yeah, there's lots of it. So you just go to chrisnoggle.com. It's N-A-U-G-L-E. That little 90-minute video I talked about will literally pop up right in front of your face. Click that video, watch it, or it's a 10-part video series if you can't get through 90 minutes. And then after you watch that, I mean, you'll probably have the same thing I did. And then after that, Book a call with us and we'll be happy to answer your questions. The one thing I will promise you is nobody that you talk to will ever try to sell you anything. They will find out what your problem is and they will help you solve it. And if you can solve, if if we can help solve your problem by teaching you something new, and there's no cost for any of this, then you can then ask us to help you. And that is then when we would get paid. And it's not coaching, but it's us helping you set up this private banking system. So that's how it works, folks. But there's free books. You can go on that website and get all my books for free. I give them all away for free. I normally have copies of them because this is a new studio. They're up front. So grab all my books and just, we do six webinars every week, totally free. So, so I give wanna, your best stuff away. I agree. And I want to, I want to encourage you, each of you listeners to, to accept at face value. I mean, you can hear Chris or me or anybody else with skepticism and think there's some catch. There's not. It's information, but there's a three-step process. I-T-I, information, transformation, implementation, or integration. Information, transformation, integration. So you've now had an invitation to go get some information. You can decide whether or not it will change the way you handle your money and whether or not this process of banking makes sense to you and you want to do it. And if you do, then it will integrate into your life like it has for Chris and the fellow that he was talking about. I've seen 
this presentation. And 90 minutes is a small amount of time. So if you think, I don't have time for 90 minutes, what you're really saying is, I don't have time for 90 minutes to change my life. And I say the same thing to clients that I coach. Uh, you know, I have free stuff. The website here on the page, yourultimatelife.ca. There's free stuff. Oh, yeah. No, it's not. There's no money cost to it. But if you go get the five master keys to your ultimate life, there's going to be a hell of a lot of time, a lot more than 90 minutes invested in changing who you're being. So the idea that you get a free lunch is nonsense. The information is free. The benefit comes when you make choices about yourself, about how you show up and what you choose to do so that you can reap the benefits from that. Chris, thank you for being with us today. Oh, it was my pleasure. And, and I love that you hit that time is our single most valuable resource we have because we can't get any of it back. So money aside, when people give the time, they're given the ultimate. Thank you. You betcha. So Chris Noggle, C-H-R-I-S-N-A-U-G-L-E, chrisnoggle.com. You got it. Okay, chrisnoggle.com. And I go there. Like, go there and investigate. Because my first question was, tell us how you add good to the world. And freedom, ability to plan your financial destiny, opportunity to make choices that others don't get to make or don't realize they get to make. There's a lot of power and opportunity in that place. So, Chris, once again, thanks for being here with us. It was an honor and a privilege. Now, go do this. Like, if you just listen to this, it's going to be nothing for you unless you take action. It's going to be another thing you say, oh, yeah, you know, I'll look at that sometime, which is useless. This and everything else you hear on every, every episode are powerful and they're true. And if you do something with them, they will help you create your ultimate life. Open your heart in this time around. Stand. Thank you for listening to today's episode. We hope that you take it deeply into your heart and decide for yourself how you can create anything you desire. If you like what you heard, please subscribe to this podcast and share it with your friends. As always, we'd love to hear your feedback and topic suggestions. Until tomorrow, this is Your Ultimate Life with host Kellen Flukiger. Stand with your heart in the sky and your feet on the ground.